felt people around me. It's like I know that they're there. It's like I just share my space with them. I've heard of many deaths occurring back here. My first experience, of course, is door slamming. Our first stop here in Bargetown is the Chapees House. Built back in 1787, it's hard to believe that this historic home was actually once slated to be demolished. That was until Colonel Michael Masters and his wife saved it and spent over eight months restoring it back to almost its original form. We just figured we had to have it. Uh, it was an old house built very solidly, uh, but it was cosmetically in very poor condition. So we spent eight months restoring everything. We took off eight layers of wallpaper. Uh, we re uh, finished the floors. Uh, we made this thing probably better than it was in, 18, in the 1800s. Today, the Chapees House is considered Kentucky's home for bourbon. As an event house, the home is now used to host dinner parties, weddings, receptions, and probably the most popular, bourbon tasting parties. It's a historic piece of property that captured the heart of Colonel Michael Masters and his wife, Margaret Sue. The great thing about this house is that it was an orphan when we found it. His grandson, Lynn Chapees, so that's that guy. Okay. The home was built by Henry Chapees of France, who came to America with General Marquis Lafayette to join George Washington's Continental Army in the American Revolution. Dr. Henry Chapees was a frontier physician, and of course he uh, practiced medicine today when, when probably the technology wasn't all that great. So there are a lot of people that came here for help and probably expired. The Chapees house also served a purpose during the Civil War, especially after the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky in 1862. Uh, after the Battle of Perryville, thousands and thousands of soldiers were, were killed and many thousands more were wounded. And all the big houses here received uh, soldiers, um, wounded soldiers uh, in their homes. That uh, kind of phenomenon is a frequent uh, kind of thing here in Bardstown because all the big houses became hospitals. So I'm, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of those soldiers did, you know, passed away here. In Bargetown's earliest days, it wasn't the quiet southern town that you'd experience today. Law wasn't always accompanied by order. Bargetown was a dueling town, and a lot of the uh, people that succumbed to being shot in those duels came here to either uh, be repaired or to die. When we first bought the house, all the women who worked here in the Chamber of Commerce and the Tourist Commission said, have you met Henry yet? Dr. Uh, Chapees had two children. One was Henry and one was Ben. And Henry uh, grabs your leg as you go up the steps on the fourth step. He's a playful little kid. He died at seven years old. Uh, died in that room right above your head. The cellar was once used to house the slaves that worked for the Chapees family. And today, some people say that when they go to the cellar by themselves, they feel as if they are not alone. It's rumored that some former slaves are actually buried in the ground of the very cellar they once used as their home. I felt the oppression down there. Um, you know, that's, uh, it's not an easy thing to talk about or to experience, but I felt the oppression down there. So, uh, you know, when, when Patty Starr comes here to do uh, 
ghost investigation, she picks up a lot of uh, indications in the cellar, along the steps, in front of the windows. Patty Starr is the founder of Ghost Chasers International in Lexington, Kentucky. She's been investigating reports of the paranormal for decades and has investigated the Chapee's house along with many other Bargetown haunts. And then when I turn this on, the first Patty brings along a wide range of devices she believes helps her connect with the spirit world. It's called the ghost meter. And um, it is um, an EMF meter, electromagnetic field meter. That's why when I, I try to turn out as many lights as I can so that when these go off, I don't feel like I'm getting um, the, that type of uh, interference. The ovulus is a meter that um, picks up the uh, energies and then it just sort of translates those energies into words. It's called the PX, very similar to the ovulus. And it has a setting called a ping setting. And I like to use that when sometimes you just won't get them to come through for words. I don't know if it's they, it takes more energy. I don't, I really don't understand. Sometimes it'll just talk and talk and other times it won't say a word. So when I put it on the ping, then I say, is there anyone here that would like to communicate with me? Ping. And then I might start asking yes and no questions. Are you a male? Are you a female? And then I'll wait a moment to show people that it's just not pinging. And then I'll ask how many spirits are in the room and then it'll ping off how many spirits are in the room. We also brought along a thermal imaging camera. It will show only the heat signatures that are being put off by our surroundings. It will also detect any sudden increase or drop in temperature, a sign that paranormal investigators believe indicates possible paranormal activity. Tragic. Oh, tragic. What, what's tragic? Patty concentrated her investigation on the cellar, the site where not only visitors have had experiences, but one of our own crew as well overwhelmingly oppressive very felt very sad my stomach just like physically it started to shake then a chill runs down everyone's spine okay i'm gonna check something as we all hear what sounds like a voice coming from patty's recorder we have another type of instrument here he says help help i'm here i appreciate i'm i'm seeing you and i'm loving it thank you so much i'm almost sure that's what it said Patty plays the clip several times. This is help, help, I'm here. And that's not me talking because I start talking over it. This is help, help, I'm here. But is it paranormal in nature? Okay, here we go. See, and I'm talking in the background, so that's not me. That's a great one. We got what what kind of help oh, they want to go. They want us to ha help them over. They want to go over. Yes. At one point, I had a, a black man walk up to me with a younger boy with him, maybe 13 or 14 years old. Show her. Show her what? And they came to me and said, "We're ready to go." And so I went ahead and helped them cross over. We're gonna do it. We'll we'll send them. What's that? They want to go. They don't want to be here. We'll send them on. Were you successful in moving them on? Yes. Can you communicate with me through uh, coming close to this with your energy, and it'll make it ping? Can you do that for me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to ask you, the person or the spirit that I am communicating with, are you a male? Thank you. When I first walked down there, I immediately sensed a family. Uh, I knew that there were uh, a set of parents and I, I believe three children. So at this point, can you let me know how many spirits are down here with us? I mean, was that five? So we, we, we have five. Could you tell me if all five spirits, are they all adults?
Can you tell me if there's a mixture that maybe there's some children with you? Okay, thank you. Two, maybe two of them are children, okay. So maybe um, there's a family of you. Was there a family of five that lived down here? Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mommy. Mommy? There's a child here then? Is there a child? You said mommy? I just saw it look like a child or something right there. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. I do appreciate that, that movement there. But we would uh, wonder if you could uh, make it strong enough. Uh, might take a, a little bit of time and we will be very patient. We will wait. But if you could um, start moving and do you see something? Yeah, it was a pretty bright white went right across. Wow, that's awesome. What I saw was like right here and it went right yeah, yeah. Well, this one but it moved kind of okay. Back and across. Okay, great. Well thank you for that. In an attempt to gather additional evidence to reinforce the pings, the thermal imaging camera was put to use. I'm wondering if, if I just stood down there, yeah. then there it might possibly... Yeah, ask to come okay. Here to you. All right. To you anyway, so okay. I just want to get to where I can... All right. Now, is it better for me to yeah, kind of right see now. I want to be able to... Okay. I have my hand out here. And if you would like to get really close to me, maybe we could pick your energy up uh, around my hand. That would be wonderful. Come on, you can do it. We are trying to learn from you. Oh, I just saw a wonderful shape right there. It was wonderful, thank you. Patty provides a clear request in hopes of a temperature change. So you can come as close to my hand as you can. It would be wonderful. Are you getting any variations at all? It dropped about a temperature and a degree. Okay, around my hand or what? Good. It's back up to 40. Okay, it went down to what, 47? Yeah. The temperature did drop a slight amount, but was it genuine communication? A few minutes later, another possible EVP. Ooh, right there. Right there. It says something right there. It's not allowing me to rewind like it was before. I don't know why. It just won't let me rewind. Did you hear that? It sounded like said no. You know, what we try to do is tell the history of this house to everyone who comes here for cocktail parties, for weddings, for receptions, for bourbon tastings and dinners. Uh, we try to tell the story of the house. And the telling of that story is what saves the house. This is the old Nelson County Jail. Today it's known as the Jailer's Inn, a historic bed and breakfast that people come from miles around just to stay in overnight with the hopes of coming face to face with some of the more reluctant residents who died here. This is the uh, Nelson County Jail. It was built in 1819, used as a county jail to 1987 closing just 22 years ago. Um, when it closed, it was the oldest operating jail in the state of Kentucky. The original part is in the front building, built in 1819. The back part where I'm in now was built in 1874. This jail is just filled with history. Well, Jesse James was known to come to this area. Uh, he had family in this, around, this, around these parts. The local sheriff was there. He, his local sheriff married his uh, the Frank and Jesse James' first cousin. 
tight quarters and cramped spaces at the Nelson County Jail made for some miserable living conditions for inmates until the day they were released, while others didn't get relief until the day they were hanged. We have photographs of Phil Evans who is hung here on the property, illegal hanging, but a lynch mob came for him before in the trial. And um, through that, uh, the jailer caught wind of it, snuck him out of this jail and ran about way, took him to Louisville, held him there to trial, and then brought him back down to Arson to be tried, and then taken out and hung. One area that's not normally open to guests is the cellar of the jailer's inn. Paul took us down for a rare tour. What this is, well, prisoners were locked down here. I guess this would be considered the hole is what it was more known for. Literally, I guess. Yes, it was literally a hole. Not only because of the hinges that were here. You can see the hinges there. One time there was a door here, the lock over here, then over here. And the same with the door over here. There was a door at this time here. And it wanders back in here. Maybe you have a headroom for about two foot of space in some points. Yeah, they didn't have much room at all. Now, were, was this literally their solitary confinement? This would be the solitary confinement um, for no telling what crimes. Um, honestly, you might be thinking about uh, slaves, runaway slaves might be put down here. For a few inmates, hanging wasn't even the gateway to their freedom. The modern stories people tell about the jail revolve around some very old souls. Oh, quite a few. Quite a few people come out for the ghostly experiences that occur here. We have a story of Martin Hill who shot and killed his wife back in the late 1800s. He was uh, sentenced to death, but before he could be taken out and hung, he was became deathly ill and died in the cell, excruciating death. He, the, it was said that he, he would just cry through the night and moaning through the night in pain and agony. Um, but after his death, where he died in that cell, after his death, he has still been told and heard people, people have been known to say that he um, moans and groans through the night still. That you can hear still the, um, the moans and groans of, ring through the stone corridor with thrilling distinction. The original gallows once stood here in the backyard of the jail. They've been gone now for decades, but the terror and death the noose caused may have left an imprint on the site forever. People have had a lot of experiences back here. Had one man, been quite a few years ago, that came out here one evening and started talking to another man out here. At, while he was here, he learned that this man he was talking to was one that was hung out in the courtyard. He uh, continued to talk to him a little bit and. Then he said, he said he turned a moment, and when he realized what he was, who he was talking to, he turned one way and turned back and said that he was gone. Paul says he's not sure if he believes in ghosts or not, but he does admit he's had his share of unexplainable encounters. One of the few things that happened to me when I first started here, I was in my office in a cold winter night when it was very slow, and heard piano keys playing on, uh, right outside my office. On the piano. No one was here, and it kind of gave me a little chill. And even overnight guests sometimes experience things they just can't explain. And some of those guests don't stick around to ask any questions. Each room's had some type of experience in them. A lot of people seem to think that the 1819 room, which used to be called the upstairs dungeon, uh, where prisoners were shackled to the floor, has a lot of hauntings in it. Don't know what happened to them in the room or anything else. Guests checked into the room. She was a true believer, and her husband did not believe. Well, the next morning, all that was found was a note in their keys. On the note, it read, my husband got scared. We had to leave. I just picked up this journal. These journals are left in the room here at the Jailer's Inn, and people write comments if they had an experience or if they liked staying here. This one was written 5-10-08. And it starts out, this is Mother's Day weekend, and my mom treated me to an overnight stay in the jail. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. Last night, I stayed in this room. It was with my husband 
And in the middle of the night, the radio on the alarm clock went off two times. And there was really loud noises in the window. I've heard they're, I've heard they're good spirits and bad spirits. We saw a glass bowl in our room tump over onto the floor. I've had a clairvoyant come in and talk to me about it one night. It was a bit frightening. I also heard noises like moaning. And told me that the, he came in and helped release a lot of the good spirits and helped them move on to the, the other side. My mom woke in the middle of the night and said someone grabbed her foot and she heard a man talking. She told me there are a lot of good ghosts, there are a lot of bad ghosts, but there was one boss spirit that kind of ruled the roost around here. Someone crawled into the bed with one of the guests and she thought it was her husband until she reached over on the other side and felt her husband and somebody else up against her, kind of spooning her. So, so we'll go there now. We'll go there now. Patty Starr begins her investigation in the 1819 room. Located at the top of the stairs, this room has been the site of many ghostly encounters, and Patty believes our chances are good to capture evidence here. Jesus. Wow. Jesus is not part of the words. Okay, we do have a help. Christian. Christian. We'd like to start name. Because it says Jesus. We want to thank you for the name of the people that have lived here that have Did you die here? Oh, you died here. Okay. So were you maybe a prisoner? Yes. Oh. Adam. Got a name, Adam. Is that the name of the um is that your name, the one that's talking to me now? Charles. Okay, we got another name, Charles. Anyone, who, who climbed in this bed last night? The person that slept here said someone crawled in the bed with her. Who was it? Bad memories. Bad memories, oh, okay. That's a sentence, guys. It's not programmed to talk in sentences. Another message? Okay. Thank you. You sounded like it went me. The person that slept here said someone crawled in the bed with her. Uh, Who was it? Uh, uh, Whoa. Can you do that again? I thought it was in the wall. I thought it was the lamp, but it's not. So if you Okay. Okay, are you ready to... I'm going to turn this off. So that said Gotham, I don't know. How do you turn it off? I don't know what that was. Okay, can you come back to me? Thank you. Okay, are you the spirit, or the ghost, that crawled into the bed with the lady that slept here tonight? Can you beat for yes, do nothing for no? Thank you. Jamie tends to help spirits cross over. Are you one of those spirits that have found her and you wish to cross over through her uh, techniques? Once for yes, no, do nothing for no. Okay. She says, she says okay, and she will do that for you. We will leave um, this room now, and Jamie can go ahead and help you as promised. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay, let's go on out. Come on, babe. She's gonna, she's gonna do her thing and send them on. Shut the door and give her some privacy. A guest room downstairs there was um, a very large man 
who for whatever set of reasons felt like he was contained to that room. And uh, Paul had told us that just the night before, a, a couple, uh, a woman had felt like a, her husband got into bed with her and when she rolled over, there was no one there. So I, I'd be willing to bet that that was him. And before we left, he, he clearly, he wanted to leave. So I, I did send him on. Built towards the end of the 19th century, the old Talbot Tavern is a Bargetown landmark. Once one of the last stagecoach stops for pioneers leaving Kentucky for the West, it's said to be one of the most haunted locations in Bargetown. Many famous people throughout American history have come to Bargetown and stayed at the Talbot Tavern, including Abraham Lincoln, Daniel Boone, and probably one of their more infamous visitors liked to throw back a few rounds. And it just so happened he left a few behind as well. The bullet hose from Jesse James is what I'm told. It's a really cool thing, really. Uh, evidently, he had a, his cousin was a sheriff in Nelson County, so when the heat got on in Missouri, he'd come out here, let it die off. His relatives had owned that they said that he stayed there a lot. So he was him and his brother Frank were in the county a lot. This room is now closed to the public, but for the first time, our cameras can give you a glimpse behind the door of the room that Jesse preferred. Beautiful murals once covered these walls, and according to legend, at least for Jesse, those murals would take on a life of their own. Uh, it was uh, supposedly painted by King Louis Philippe of France. One of his entourage had painted it. They said that, you know, he got drunk and the birds were flying out of the murals at him. And he was shooting at the birds. So. Unfortunately, the murals were destroyed in a devastating fire that ripped through the Talbot in 1998. But the bullet holes there remain, along with what some believe to be the ghost of Jesse James. Actually, our bookkeeper has seen him. She was walking up, sta up the stairs and she was following this man and she thought it was just a room guest. And uh, he went outside on the balcony and she followed him just to see, you know, who it was. And he turned and he gave her this hideous laugh. And she just kind of shrugged it off. And uh, then a couple nights later, she was watching a documentary about uh, Jesse James and it said he had a hideous laugh. Um, she knew right then. She said, That's the man I've seen. So, yeah, she's seen him. Feeling like Tom riding a pinto. After almost 250 years, the Talbot is still one of Bargetown's favorite watering holes. The old saloon that once catered to cowboys and historical figures of our past is now used as a dining room. But just across the hall, guests can still enjoy their spirits of the liquid kind in Talbot's bourbon bar. Thank you so much. Said after we close at night, I leave this bar and that's it. I don't go back there. I don't go in the kitchen. I don't. I don't take garbage out of nothing. So I mean, I take the garbage outside, but not, not back anywhere in there. Kenny Young has been working as a security guard for the Talbot for almost 10 years. He's seen his share of rowdiness, and he keeps patrons in line when he needs to. Yeah, I definitely believe in this place is haunted. At least the ones he can see. Whether you're a security guard, big guy or not, you can't do nothing about that. Uh, back during the ice storm, real big ice storm we had, uh, I stayed uh, a couple nights up here in room five, and they always told me about the cheer, that whoever died in there don't want you to put the clothes in the chair. You wake up in the morning, they'd be off on the floor. Well, the first night I stayed there, I woke up, my clothes was on the floor. But I thought the other guys in the other room was just playing jokes on me. Well, the second night I stayed here, I actually pushed them down in the chair where I knew they wouldn't roll off. Well, I said, I was gonna see this. So I actually stayed up and watched, and I watched my clothes roll out that chair on the floor. And it was the most scariest thing I ever saw in my life, but I actually seen it. Whether well, people believe it or not, I seen it. And uh, at Saturday, next night, I didn't stay here. I stayed with my parents back out in the motel room. And on many occasions here, I mean, I, I felt people around me just, just know somebody's there and somebody not be there physically. The kitchen area is also believed to be an active spot in the tavern. 
Brian Vincent works there as a cook, and it wasn't long before he had his first encounter with something unseen. I was taking a roast out that they've been cooking for a while, and I felt felt something like somebody touch me, touch me on the shoulder, just just a light, just a light grab on my shoulder, and I dropped dropped the, dropped the roast pan with the roast in it on my, on my forearm and went out of the kitchen for about, about 20 minutes. It scared me pretty bad, so I told the management at the time that I was gonna take, take a small extended break. I've never had any bad experiences, but with, with, with the oven incident, uh, I mean, it did feel like somebody, somebody touched me on, on my shoulder. It wasn't in a bad way, it was just let me know that somebody was there. The ghostly activity at the Talbot isn't confined to just a few spots. Uh, it's pretty much all over. I've heard different stories about all over the place. Especially down in the basement. I've heard some pretty creepy stories about down in the basement. I feel like I want to go that way, but I can't. You know, like something's stopping me. The cellar of the Talbot Tavern is also a place that most workers try to stay out of. I can understand why the, why the employees don't like to go down there alone. We found out why when we went to the basement. I just ran into someone. And Jamie immediately felt that we weren't there alone. I felt it cold, but I mean, that could be... No, I mean, I ran into someone. Not, I ran into cold air. I ran into someone. I went out, I went out, I went out, I went out. When Patty Starr and her husband Chuck arrived, we decided to start the investigation in the basement area. So you think you're getting something like right here, so I'm going to take my probe. And I'm... Holy cow. Is there a spirit here? that would like to communicate with me, like right in here. Oh, wow, right away. Are you, are you still in the room? OK, it's still in the room. I didn't think it would answer so quickly. Will you help? Assistance, OK. Do you need to go on to move on? An altar, OK. Do you know what we're doing here? You said yes. Oh, there is music upstairs, yes. They kept the, the munition down here during the Civil War. Seat. Many seats. Oh, George. George Talbot on this place. Thank you for George. Thank you for George. Can you give us any, any other names? Ann, he was married to Annie, guys. George Talbot was married to Annie, so we've got mother. George. There, she was a mother. I would really like a name. Magic. Uh, uh, something just moved that strap. M move to strap. I swear to God. This move to strap, strap. Your strap. This right here. It just moved, and I cool. didn't touch it. Okay. It up here. Is someone moving? Yeah. Moving around, Chris. Chris. Just in the room. Did it? That's what it sounded like to me too. Cool. This is awesome. Thank. Pardon me? What was that? Kelly. Kelly owns this place right now. Kelly owns the Talbot right now. But is the device talking about the current or the past owner of the Talbot Tavern? Is that, is Jack. that? Jack. Jack. <laughs> All right, now y'all not gonna believe this. Jack Kelly owns, it was one of the original owners of this place, plus little Jack it took Fair over. Bye started managing it. After Patty's device said the name Jack, only the mics on our camera picked up this EVP. Is that, is Jack. that? Jack. 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 This is incredible about Jack and the Kellys. It said George and Anna. And Anne, he said Anne, but Anna was his wife. 
This is incredible that we've gotten this kind of this kind of information that's related to here. Cause I is this really Jack trying to communicate with us? We don't know who it is. It's just somebody that's here that's feeding us this information. But it's accurate. But it's accurate. It's letting us know that it's an intelligent, it's something that's intelligent that knows all this. Does anyone have the time? I think we should start wrapping up and so that we could go set up in that room upstairs. Chuck, do you know where the light is? Can you turn it on? Okay, we're headed upstairs. Oh, thank you. Okay, hold on. Let me turn this down just a little bit more. Okay, now, let's see. How many spirits are here? Can you ping out how many are here? How many? What was that, three or four? Three. three. Okay. Is Jesse James here? Can you ping if Jesse James is here? Be honest. <sighs> so I guess Jesse James is not here tonight. Is the little girl spirit here tonight? Is she here? Oh, she is? Do you think it would be possible to turn this light out? Because if you turn this light out, then they would know that I've been communicating with you and you don't understand what I'm saying. If you don't want to turn that light out, can you turn this one up? And if you don't want to turn this one up, can you open this door? I know a lot of times you'll do one of the other. Although the spirits didn't appear to want to show off, one may have shown up. What happened? Oh. The orb swirled around me. And it's still there. Oh my good God is almighty. Is it good? Where is it? Let me get it. It's right by the door. This is where my meter went off while I go, hey, we picked you up. Uh, oh, I got to see that. Our night vision camera picked up this orb flying around Patty Starr's legs. Who? Orb. We did get two orbs. Can you give me a name? I won't get off the orb thing, that's wild. Bill. I got it. Did you hear it? Got Bill, thank you. <laughs> he said, how is book? Thank you for asking about my book. <laughs> I just wrote a book. <laughs> it's called Ghost Town in Kentucky. Thank you. <gasps> Said Bill again. We got orb. Remember how many times we got orb? Can you give me a name? Can you give me a name? Who's in this room with us? Is Bill with us tonight? If Bill is with us tonight, can you give me your name? No. Oh, you need help. Okay, we can do that. Is Bill here with us tonight? We need to know. Help build something. What is your message? Oh, you want help? We all these people, that, all these spirits that want help. What is your message? Beast. Ooh, beast. We'll close on that one. Are people really encountering the spirits of those who've already died? Or are they just experiencing the remnants of energy and emotions that were left behind on these locations decades ago? 
try some Kentucky bourbon at the Chapee's house, or stay overnight in the Talbot Tavern or the Jailer's Inn, and you decide for yourself.